Hello, everybody, and a very big welcome to the Governance Evaluator Governance Insight webinars. We welcome you today, and we are absolutely delighted to have Claire Brown, the co founder and CEO of Women on Boards. Claire's going to talk to us today about an incredibly important subject for all boards and their agendas right now, and that's gender equity and social inclusion. Claire, we all live in a time when we genuinely would love to have a safe and equal society. And that means that we believe everybody should have equal access to power, resources and opportunities and all treat each other with dignity, respect and fairness. And that's really a basic human right. And we all know that if we actually do that, as a society, we'll have a better economy, a better society, and I believe we'll actually be a hell of a lot healthier. So a very big welcome to you today. And thank you so much for coming to share with us your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, B. And uh, yes, you are right. Uh, a utopian world, particularly on the back of what's been happening in South Africa. And I think if anything, COVID has shown us what unequal access to resources, in fact, really does. And we've always known it uh, for people in developing nations um, in terms of access, in, in their case, to the critical vaccine. But here, um, one of the areas that WAB is particularly focused on is the issue of affordable housing. And we are really facing a crisis in Australia in relation to affordable housing and people being able to simply put a roof over their head. Again, a fundamental human right. I know many people on this call are from the non-profit sector and the non-profit sector is in fact doing most of the heavy lifting when it comes to the provision of um, affordable housing, emergency housing, crisis accommodation. Um, a bit about me. I sit on, I founded Women on Boards, I co-founded Women on Boards back in 2006 with Ruth Med in Australia and then co-founded it again in the UK in 2012. And since then we've put thousands and thousands of women on boards, on many, many, many different types of boards across many, many, many sectors. Um, and in that time, the not-for-profit sector, of course, has morphed massively um, because progressively all of the services that were provided by government have in fact been outsourced to the not-for-profit sector, which in itself is a huge misnomer because we are in fact not for loss. And there's been now, and so now the, really the bulk of the area around service provision is in fact carried by that not-for-profit sector. I'm on the board of uh, Coast Shelter on the Central Coast, which turns over about $10 million and we provide emergency and crisis accommodation principally for youth um, and also for women, women with children. So, for example, we will get sent um, a woman and three children arrived from Western Australia the other day. Um, she was literally flown over, put on the plane at the Perth airport by the police who said, do not let her come back because he will kill her. And, of course, that's the sort of thing that happens. Um, and she's now in one of our shelters. The children spent several weeks hiding under a table. Many of you know this type of story. So the nonprofit sector is not only grappling with all those kind of very real challenges, but some really significant governance challenges too. There's an increasing amount of regulation through the ACNC and also a really big focus around how we think about and structure our boards. Um, I'm also chair of the Conservatorium of Music on the Central Coast, which turns over about a couple of million dollars. Uh, funnily enough, classified as a large charity by the ACNC, anything over a million dollars, which doesn't buy you a house in any capital city these days. Um, and so, uh, you know, you know it, it really is, it is very interesting times. So a lot of people are thinking, you know, why are gender equity and social inclusion important and why do they matter? At WOB, we've been talking about equity forever as opposed to about equality. We've had equality in Australia for years. Um, we have had the same rules governing everything that we do. So uh, the Sex Discrimination Act was brought back in 1984 by Susan Ryan. So all of those things, so all of those workplace behaviours that exist now have in fact been legislated against. So we've had a legislative framework. But I think what everybody's realised is it's the 
cultural overlay over the top of that legislative framework that really makes the difference. And equality, of course, hasn't necessarily served women well. This is just one of those really classic pictures that shows you the difference between equality and equity. Tall person on the left, um, given the same size box as the short person on the right, neither of them can see over the fence. Sometimes you have to give people access to more. And so when it came to women on boards, for example, women needed, I suppose, a bigger leg up when you look at this kind of diagram than the men did at the time that we started because there were so few women sitting on board. So that's equality, that's equity. To just kind of spell it out, equality is sameness, equity is fairness. And Fee spoke when she opened about a, about fairness. Sameness is about giving everybody the same thing. E.g., well, it's now 10% superannuation. That only works if everyone starts from the same place if we want equal outcomes. Incomes. Access to the same opportunities is about fairness. So sufficient retirement savings after a lifetime of work and caring to retire so you don't wind up in a low rent tenancy housing scheme where many, many women, older women are in fact um, winding up. So equity is a framework that enables us to have equal outcomes for people. And lots of people reject that because they say, where's the place then for personal in initiative? Where's the kind of liberalism within that? And, and I think in, in Australia, we struggle with the tension um, that those two things bring. And I think it's very possible to have both. Um, again, back to my picture, in the first image, it's assumed that everyone will, have, will benefit from the same supports because they've been treated equally. You heard many, many times men say, oh, yeah, but women are being treated equally. Why can't they just step up and why can't they get it done? Um, it's a bit like, you know, saying to someone in a wheelchair, they're the stairs, we can all go up them. Well, that ain't going to work. If you're in a wheelchair, you need a ramp. Um, in the second image, individuals are given different supports, of course, to make them have equal access. And in the third image, we've removed all of the supports because the cause of the inequity was addressed. And that's a very advanced way of thinking and something that we don't, we don't often get to that third place, um, the systemic barriers to things. Um, social inclusion is different. Now, many boards wrap them up as the same thing. They are quite different. Of course, there's so inclusion in general. Uh, you've got social, economic and, and political, and that's just a nice diagram which pulls those together. So political in, in inclusion, the right to vote, being able to influence decisions, participating in civil and political activities or civil and political unrest. Economic inclusion, that's the one probably where we're struggling the most in this country. Um, as I said, the right to vote, because we of course have a mandatory voting system, um, really mandates the political in, in inclusion. But the economic in, in, in inclusion, we've got a gender pay gap. Um, I don't know whether you're auditing across your organisations as board members. I'm assuming many of you would be reporting through the Workplace Gender Equality Agency because you'd have um, more than 100 employees within your organisation. If that's the case, it's a great place to benchmark and look at data because the gender pay gap is still sitting around 14, 15% and higher across many sectors. So that's something that we need to be thinking about. If you have a daughter, she starts work and two years later she's earning less uh, than the neighbour's son in the same sector. So we need to be understanding why that is happening, back to removing those systemic barriers. And then of course there's social inclusion, having meaningful relationships and feeling valued, welcome and, um, and included. And this was a nice report which I've included the a link from um, that Deloitte did in 2019 and it defined them and it said while diversity and inclusion may be inextricably linked, they're not one and the same. Diversity refers to the presence of people who as a group have a wide range of characteristics, seen and unseen. So that includes gender, race, ethnicity, status across life, geography, disability, all of those things. And inclusion refers to the practice of making members feel welcomed and giving them an equal opportunity to connect, belong and grow. Many organisations are open to 
diversity, but they fail on the inclusion bit. So all, so many boards opened themselves up and said, okay, we'll get more women on the board, we'll get more young people, we'll get more geographically diverse people, but then they actually didn't include them. And so you'll have those stories where, you know, you'll get sort of lovely stories where, you know, a bunch of old blokes sitting on the credit union at, at Orange, and that exists really, let me tell you, um, a very large non-profit, the chair's been there for, I think, 30 plus years, um, they said something like, oh, yeah, we tried one of those once. It just didn't work out. So they did the first bit, but they missed the second bit, okay? Um, and the main difference, do is, the main difference, which I think is a really nice way to think about it, is that diversity is a state of being and not something that is governed, while inclusion is a set of behaviours that can be governed and can't be changed. Um, why does DNI matter at board at, at um, board level? Um, the board sets the example from the top. The buck stops with the board. You all know this. Your behaviours are on show. Uh, your culture is on on show. If you're a, a board of bickering, fighting, non-inclusive. Um, homogenic people, that is in fact how your organisation will look. You cannot be what you cannot see when you're looking up from the bottom. It's important for you to be building credibility with management, investors, customers, employers and other stakeholders. Teams and organisations, there's loads of, of um, research, perform better. They're harder to manage, but they perform better when they're both diverse and inclusive. And of course, it adds long-term stakeholder and shareholder value. And on the right, I've just included a member of one of our WARP Cultural Diversity Committees, sorry, it's a bit of a fuzzy picture, who's someone called uh, Malini Raj, and she started out her board career on committees at Finzia. She's now at a very senior role within the Commonwealth Bank, and she makes the point that Australia is one of the world's most culturally diverse countries, and our boards need to reflect this, and they don't. And cultural diversity, we've tackled the gender balance issue when it comes to women. WOB has always advocated 40-40-20, 40% men, 40% women, 20% of either and or any other gender. But at a cultural level, for male or female, we have not even begun to scratch the surface. And I think that's really important. A few practical tips. Um, you've got to be aware of your own behaviours and biases, we all have them, I have them, you have them, Fee has them. Um, and there was a lot around unconscious bias training for a long time and a lot of people kind of went through unconscious bias training. They all went, yep, yeah, I'm unconsciously biased. That's great, I'm unconsciously biased, therefore I can't do much about it. Um, it, it wasn't in itself particularly useful for the next step, which is again removing those systemic barriers. You need to change your language and change your assumptions, and that's really hard. And as a board, it's quite difficult to be doing that. So what's the message that you're sending through the organisation? If you're the chair, are you inviting people to share their story and sharing your own story? How much of your story are you sharing? Are you inviting people in the organisation to share their story? What are you, have you got sponsors, mentors, coaches? Is that all active within the board ecosystem and within the organisation? So is that really healthy way of, of nurturing and supporting others um, active and on show within the board? Are you doing it back to the CEO? Are you doing it back through to the C-suite? You need to look at the decisions that you make through the lens of gender and social equity and inclusion, not just equality, not just is this the same rule for everybody else. We're a massively compliance-driven society. Personally, I think it's leading in many ways to us being able to actually break down a lot of the barriers and address a lot of the inequity that it it exists because it's a very legislated framework and I don't think that that always works for everybody. Um, you really, need, it's a bit like having a gender lens on the on the national budget. Policy does not affect everyone equally, just as board decisions don't affect everyone equally. Um, I'm sure you've all got a good process for board and director selection, uh, where gender is actually included as a skill and an experience. Many people actually say, oh, you can't do that. It's the best person for the job, the dear old merit argument. Um, 
you know, if, if there was true merit in the political selection process, do you think we'd have a front bench that is mostly male? I don't think so. So we actually need to have gender needs to be included. If you lack women on the board, if you lack people who represent a certain group, if you're, for example, an organisation that provides social housing to in the in, in Indigenous um, people, then you need to be saying, okay, who do we have on these boards that understand who has lived experience but actually has the capacity to actually do this? Can we do things like, for example, set up advisory groups to advise the boards? How are we structuring our advisory groups to pick up those additional sort of skill sets and experiences that we are, in fact, really, really missing? Um, and careful of your language and hiring practices because language can really put people off as well. Um, this is a, a picture that I said, a couple of the other things that um, you could do. You turn off the spotlight and you turn on the floodlight. And Arnie Ulla, who brought in quota law in Norway, when she spoke at our conference in Australia in 2009, she said what Norway did when it implemented the quota system is it turned off the spotlight and it turned on the floodlight. And all of a sudden, you could say all those women in this instance who could lay equal claim to a role, who were all sitting on the edge of that circle, all of a sudden you could see them because there are many, many people out there who lay equal claim to a um, role. Um, support the new board member who may be of a different gender or culturally diverse or even better still, um, <laughs> get two of them because then they can really kick some butt. And I'm pretty sure that might have been photoshopped, but I really enjoyed the... I, I actually really liked it. It makes a really big point. Years ago, um, uh, McKinsey and co. wrote an article where it took the magic of the number three, saying you actually need three of a type, culture, person, gender in, in, in that instance to be able to make it not an issue, to be able to make it a playing field where everybody could have a turn and where they weren't going to be savaged. Um, and so I think that that's really one of the critical things um, that I have noticed. But uh, see, I'll, I'll stop sharing this. What was the um, name of the lady in Norway? I'll tell you. Her name was Ani Ulla. And uh, interesting story. I actually did my Churchill Fellowship in, in, in Norway, and I met the chairs of all of the major companies. And Stein Renamo, who in fact is, it was the chair of Statoil in, which was the world's 43rd largest company. Well, the chairs of major Norwegian companies or major global companies, you know, he was at a serviced office because one, they did not believe that an independent board should have its offices within the organization wandered downstairs, opened the door to me, took me upstairs, made me a, I don't know, fish paste sandwich of some sort and a cup of tea. And it was a very different experience when I went and met the chair of um, the Royal Bank of Scotland, which was, you know, seven ante rooms, four secretaries and, um, you know, three, and the carpet got ever, ever, ever plusher. And it was a really different way of thinking. And the other interesting thing about the Norwegians is that their nominations committees for their listed companies don't come from the companies. So they actually have to have all of the members of the nominations committee from outside the organisation. Um, which brings me to a, 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 a another point, co-opt people. Co-opt expertise to help. So, for example, if you've got a, a, a nominations committee to recruit a, a couple of directors, go and get a high-flying HR person who and say, look, can we just pop you on this committee for two or three months because they'd be delighted to help and you've suddenly brought in all this skill and all this ex ex expertise and you can do that. If you set up a really quality committee structure, you can co-opt that expertise externally to, to help you out. So I really think that that's been something um, uh, um, to, to, to think about because it, it quite often non-profit boards get overfaced and they think, oh my gosh, I can't have a governance committee, a nominations committee, and I can't have all these things. Some of them you can just pop up and down and some of them you can just get people in. And for many younger people, the opportunity to serve in an advisory capacity or on a committee or to do it for six months is something that they would really welcome. And so you can get, you can harvest a lot of that 
diversity and expertise that you don't have on the board and you might have room for, you can actually get that by setting up really quality at, at, at advisory committees. The only proviso is give them really good terms of reference and um, set them up in quite a structured way. That's my only advice when it comes to those. Um, any questions? I'm very happy to... Yes, Claire. Um, so there has been some questions. And um, one of the really... Uh, I think this is a really good question. And this is about how do you get the diverse voices heard at the board? So you know how in a lot of our work we're all about, like in aged care, you need to hear the voice of the consumer yep. at the table. But this is about the diverse voices within the community and some of our minority groups, and we've seen this in the rollout of COVID, they, they're they quiet, they, they don't speak or we don't speak their language. And there's, there's some questions around how, have you got any tips for how we actually get those voices? Uh, how do we get them to speak up? And better still, how do we get the board to listen? Okay, are they board members or are they ad ad advisory members? I think we're talking about actually getting the voice of the community we represent. So, for example, if you're sitting on a community health board, one of the most important things is not just to ha necessarily have one of the minority groups represented at the boardroom table, but their voice represented at the boardroom table. So it's about how, what are some of the strategies for getting those voices to the table or getting minority groups to actually speak up? I think, as I said, I think one of the best ways is the board has to un has to know what it doesn't know and own what it doesn't know. And if the voice of, for example, a minority group because they've got a particular health issue um, is one of those things, then it's I can see why it's difficult because you can't ask people to do a presentation to the board or they'd fall over with fear. Um, so how do you actually do that? I still think the advisory committee a approach or take the board out to that community or take two or three members of the board out to that community. It's a bit like when you do um, a cultural Im immersion, um, sometimes when you do walking on, on Aboriginal land, when you do that for a half day. We're about to do that, in fact, with our Coast Shelter Board. When we've got our new board members on, we're actually going to use that as a building and knowing exercise for each other, but we're actually going to use it as an opportunity to walk on and understand Aboriginal land from an Aboriginal perspective. So we're actually going to do that as a board exercise, put us, put us in the hands of those people and let them walk us through. Um, the other thing is, is when you're recruiting board members, I think it was on the last webinar that we were on, somebody said that uh, um, we're now going back to saying we need people who understand the issues and the community. So we actually need experienced district health nurses. Um, we need a couple of those voices on a board because they will have the stories and the experiences that others don't have. And then they will be a link back through to that community and be an enabler for that community. So I think when we recruit, when you're recruiting for board members, people really need also to have deep understanding of the topic area, particularly when it's around complex and difficult issues like health, homelessness, all of those sort of social and and impact things. It's all very well to have high flyers on who can raise funds, but you need to know what your purpose is and what you're raising funds for. <laughs> exactly. And Claire, there's a couple more. If we continue on that thread around Skills Matrix, um, another really good question, and I, and I think this is really important and we can both tackle this question, so how do you actually include diversity and gender in a board skills matrix? Like, it's like, so what are the questions you were allowed to ask people and, and how do we cover that? Um, okay, we've just done a survey on cultural diversity and, in fact, we were divided, uh, we were guided by, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, diversity, it's not called Diversity uh, Australia. I'm just trying to think of what the, of, of the organisation is called. I'll think of it then. Uh, and half a second. And I go and look for 
what we can actually do. There is nothing to say you can't ask people if they are culturally and linguistically diverse or if they identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander or not. Um, people aren't forced to answer, answer questionnaires. But if you invite the response, if you ask them if they are, they might actually appreciate being asked. But you can also, many of our board ads say that they are looking for, particularly on our government boards, we're looking for somebody with cultural and linguistic diversity, or we're looking for a representative of the Aboriginal community, or we're looking for someone from remote and regional areas. So you can actually specify that. There's nothing wrong with, with, with specifying that. Don't be afraid about it, because if you're including it in your board skills, matrix, if, if that is part of the community that you're serving, then that really goes to say that you actually need people with topic area experience in the sector that you are in. There are very few people without oil and gas experience serving on oil and gas boards. <laughs> and that's fine, right? So why is it not fine for you to be saying, um, you know, I need someone who is of Aboriginal um, origin or, or who is an Aboriginal person who has had experience in the, I don't know, health, education, blah, blah, blah areas. There's nothing wrong with actually doing that. Um, Constance, the best arguments against the whole sort of merit thing, look, that was done so long ago. It's very scary, that one, that it still actually comes up. You can't get the best person for the job if you just keep tapping people on the shoulder that you know, because you don't know who you don't know. And that's always a huge argument. People say, oh, the best people will apply for the job. Well, when you do a breakdown and you look at who applies for jobs, and you can say, why in a health board did we suddenly get 500 applications from men and 40 from um, females? That makes no sense because if we look at the ABS data, we know that the sector is in fact female dominated um, from nearly all aspects except in, in, in some instances um, from a clinician's point of, of, of view. So you've got to break it down, you've got to use the data um, and the, the reality is, is that merit is in the eye of the beholder. Does an accountant bring more merit than a lawyer? Does brings more merit than a nurse? Brings more merit than a doctor? Brings more merit than a psychologist? I can't answer that. So you've got to actually structure your um, selection and you've got to structure your nominations processes so that you're very careful and you're asking quite often for transferable skills, not for specific skill sets, because that will really help you um, too. Um, Google, you know, Merit, Google Catherine Fox, she's got wonderful um, arguments against the whole kind of sort of, you know, merit thing. Um, you hear it less and less now. Um, which is really, really helpful. Um, yes, working in the health sector, our staff are overwhelmingly female and our board is overwhelmingly female. How do you assess gender equity? It's a bit like Netball Australia. They need a few men. Um, <laughs> okay, so it might be that you're thinking about that and saying, why are the staff overwhelmingly female? And if the board has a majority of female members, are you looking at your customer base? So your staff are overwhelmingly female, but are your customers overwhelmingly female or are your customers male and female and young and old? Do they belong to a particular cultural group? Are you working in a particular sector of the, of the community? Because if that's the case, that's a really strong argument to be saying, well, in fact, we're not representative at the board level of our stakeholders and our customers. For example, we might have a major government customer. Do we have people with good government and policy experience? So that's how I would be thinking about that one. Uh, Kelvin's asked, how many governance boards are using advisory boards to solve specific issues? Say, for example, customer experience, many. Um, um, I'd have a, a lot of women who are caring for consumers of aged care have, or have, um, Experience. Yes, advisory boards, it's not an advisory board, it's an advisory body. An advisory board is not a governance board. You've got to be really careful. They do not have the same level of legal obligation and they do not have the same rights within the organisation. So when you set up an advisory body, they are there for advice. They are not there to do things for you unless you ask them specifically. They're not there to solve the problem, they're there to guide you. 
So it's actually about guidance, it's not about solving it. If they're solving it for you, they then become a consultant and you probably need to be paying them. So it's a different way of thinking about it. So an advisory board is there to give you insight into something that you didn't understand or you didn't know about, um, whether it be the health of Indigenous people in the Grampians or something, okay? So you need to think about what it is that you want the advisory board to do and you need to be very specific about the terms of of um, reference. And here's my old friend, Deb Col Colville. Hello, Deb. Um, <laughs> what tips do you have whereby women's ideas, yeah, yeah, and that has been, look, that has been said from the ASX down. I know women on major ASX boards who still say, yep, yeah. and until Fred said it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't even going to be my idea. You've got a caucus. You've got a caucus and, yes, topic, yes, exactly. I've been watching that as well. It's fabulous. And they really struggled. Even even people like Julie Bishop, I mean, and we all just go, oh, my gosh, you know, the woman is amazing and absolutely terrifying. So I think you have to caucus. I think you have to pick your chair and you have to have a good chair and a chair has to understand and listen to all of the voices. A chair has to say less rather than say more. And you need to have got the ear of the chair and of the influential people on the board before the meeting. I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, you should talk about a lot of things outside the actual board meeting, but the reality is it happens. And a good chair would have nearly rung everybody on, on the organisation at some point on the board during or between the actual meeting cycle to have answered this, okay, to have spoken. And so I would do it that that way it's really hard um, if you've got a good colleague on the board who does have the year who'll then say Deb I know you've got a really good point to make about this that's your moment and you've got to be ready you've got to be ready when the moment happens but if you feel like you're beating away and beating away and then Fred suddenly says oh I think we should do a policy review and everybody goes oh what an excellent idea um, I suspect you're you also need to get that minuted. You need to start to get processes in place whereby you can, your ideas are noted. Um, and it is a difficult one and lots of women struggle, but uh, hopefully some of those tips have been helpful. Any more, Fee? What are we up to? We've had a lot of questions. Yeah, it's really good. But that's because this is such an important topic. And, and I honestly can tell you people are not, quite clear about where to start yeah um, um, is it is difficult in regional areas yes it is and zoom means just as somebody also said mm -hmm. regional and rural board members we have been providing directors at a distance at wob as an online program for well well before COVID, it's probably eight seven eight years i come from ebor which is i was born in hay i come from ebor which is halfway between dorigo and armadale on the top of the lovely new england and there should be no reason but rural and regional boards, if they post their vacancies more widely and say that, you know, X percentage of their meetings are via Zoom or via tech, cannot actually um, get board members. So just as Clarice has said, why does a challenge for boards mm. to appoint skilled and professionals residing in rural and regional areas? Leanne Haywood, who's just cracked her third ASX board, and she ran um, the manganese mine, I think it was, for Rio Tinto in Ulan Batar in Outer Mongolia. She lived at Peak Hill, which is sort of west of Orange. It's the biggest FIFO role I have ever, ever, ever heard um, of. It's extraordinary. And so you can do it, but you have to be prepared to travel. You have to be prepared to put yourself out there. And you really have to be prepared to make yourself known. Um, the other thing is, sorry, rural and regional people sh um, boards should be posting vacancies. Post them with the AICD. Post them with us. Post them with anyone that you can actually post them with. Let people know that those good opportunities are there. And you'd be surprised how many people have an interest, have a connection with, want to be part of those particular boards. The other thing too is, is there's lots of clubs, and clubs are sort of you know, local kind of boards. And the governance can be difficult um, and quite often they're large. Really, they're almost better off 
reduced in size and run by a committee of, of a management. And you probably should think about paying some of the directors. It's absolutely ridiculous that not-for-profit directors have to turn up quite often for long monthly board meetings and have done all the pre-work without any compensation at all. So I think that the remuneration of the non-profit director is something that's going to be a topic that's going to get a lot more currency in the next 10 years. Um, and great to hear, Clarice, that you're from a diverse and linguistic background. And that's an important thing. And absolutely. And so you need to tell people when you apply for boards, try government boards, because government boards will quite often, um, they often want people from outside major metro areas, let them know you're from a diverse and um, a diverse and diversely linguistic background. Let them know all, all of those things. You have. Let them know that you're digitally savvy. Let them know all of those things, because then people have an opportunity to say, oh, you know, people don't always guess. You think, well, that's bleedingly obvious. You know, I've been living out here for years and we've been, you know, on tech and I've been such a... Not everybody can sort of make that jump. So you do have to be... You do have to let people know things. Okay. How are we yeah. going? One thing that you talked about earlier that I know is a big question with a lot of boards I work with is that cultural piece. Because a lot of what we've talked about today is the technical aspects. A bit like you said at the beginning, um, you know, there are all the things we can do, bring women onto the board, um, those sorts of things. But what about the cultural side of things? And that comes right back to the you know, getting your whole board working as a team on this stuff and not just kind of giving lip service to it. And a few people have actually asked, how do we actually get this started? How do we, not not as individuals and not as recruiting the right people, but actually the culture of our board? Um, Personally, I think, I think you have to get some data. I think you have to actually find out what people think. I think you have to find out what your fellow board members think about the soft skill stuff that happens within the organisation. I Are the board meetings run well? Do I get a chance to participate? Um, even a basic survey that you can run with five questions mm -hmm. after a board meeting as a chair that you could just send out and say, was your voice heard? Did your topic get aired? Did you feel that we addressed all of the issues well? Um, you know, make up some more questions, you know, ask as as a chair, ask them to rate you, you know, how was it in terms of running, what would you like to see change? Because board members need to step up and own some of it. And so I think culturally, if they're saying that, and then if you pick one thing and work on that, don't try and take on everything. It's a bit like when you review the policies for the organisation. We've taken a view at my conservatorium that we're doing one a meeting. <laughs> and try review them. They all need actually looking at. They're all fine, but they all need us to actually look, look at them. We've decided we'll read one every meeting, and by meeting 10, we'll be through the lot <laughs> because it's too much work for everyone. It's too much for everyone to, to bite that off. But you've got to ask questions after the actual a meeting about what the experience is like, how the board members are feeling. I mean, are you checking in as a chair how board members what their experience is. If you've got a new board member, what's the in induction process? Did you check up with them about the induction process? Did you say, was it good, bad, indifferent? What could be changed? How can we help? Um, through COVID, I've adopted a mantra through the board. I said, our mantra is, how can we help? And I said, that is what we now ask the executive. How can we help? And if you start pushing that mantra out there, how can we help? And when somebody calls and they're in trouble and you say, how can I help? It actually is a really interesting way of changing the mindset. Um, and it also puts the onus back on somebody else to ask because we can't provide what we don't know. And so I think the chair needs to be asking the board, how can I help? Could you please fill in this survey? It can be a, a lot of Neds need to be stepping up and, and, and owning it. Um, Julie Green. Good to see you don't need any tips on your CV, Julie Green, if it's the no, Julie Green, how doesn't. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Margo. Oh, my gosh. There's loads of WAP members on. This is quite embarrassing. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> CV tips for drawing out diversity when selection courier may not seek it. Okay. 
I think you need to talk about perspective. I think that if you speak a second language, you should mention it because in Australia, that's still, it's not as rare as it was, but many of us who are purely ang- Anglo just go, oh my gosh, they speak not, you know, one, two, and three, four type of languages that you um, have worked overseas, okay, that you understand different cultures, that you've worked cross-culturally, uh, that you've worked within rural and, and regional areas. Try and give said people think in pictures quite often so i think sometimes thinking about that geographical spread um, is a really helpful way of getting people to think about drawing out diversity <laughs> thanks andrea um, <laughs> um so <laughs> i i honestly think that if you've got to in in your cv if you can talk about how you understand things that are cross-cultural how you've worked um with doing different things with different groups. Um, if you've worked in Hong Kong, if you've worked in China, if you've worked in a company that is foreign owned, uh, if you've worked within a section of, of um, government, or if you've worked across the university sector, which has mainly um, overseas students, make sure you pop it in because that can really help. Or if you live in a, a culturally and linguistically diverse community, um, you just happen to basically live there. Um, so you need to talk about what your understanding is like. And so that can help too. Um, oh, yes, I've got my... Goodness me, there's lots of experienced directors on, on here. <laughs> so I am after former Olympian. Goodness me, with Tokyo coming up. <laughs> Claire, I've got one, um, another really interesting question for you that someone who couldn't come asked me to ask. Now, we're in a time where there actually are some incredible women out there who are moving towards at that time in their life to take on chair roles. And this is on bigger boards, but it means juggling time. Therefore, the culture around people not being paid for chair or director roles. And it, it's actually quite a blockage. It is. Um, because some really outstanding candidates and okay forget I'm not going down the merit path here but outstanding candidates that aren't women that are diverse for all sorts of other reasons in other words not the usual suspect but they're at a, t- a pivotal time in their career about my age coincidentally and they actually could be that person but they would have to give up part of their career and people need to be paid. Yep. What and are we going to do about this? Because it's a huge really issue. Problem. Yeah. It's a huge issue. And the board that I'm on, we've got two people who are retired in their 70s. And this this board used to recruit for the, one of the Rotary Clubs, literally. And many of the people were, were retired because they had time. So they have meetings at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I said, guys, you want me, you want me on this board? That's the first thing that has to change. I said, because many of us can't actually do that. And so we are going to have to look at compensation, which means I think reducing the size of boards, um, really big big boards. I mean, a really good size for boards, probably nine is probably the largest. I would say seven. It's a really good number for your average board, um, and that will help. I think compensating people, compensating the chair in the first instance, because the chair will spend twice the amount of time as anyone else, and compensating the chair, particularly of things like the Audit and Risk Committee or the Audit and Finance Committee, because that's a really huge, huge, huge job. I mean, there's major, major institutions that are turning over 100, 200 million. Um, you really can't be a director on those without giving, you know, a good half day a week of your time minimum, and that's when things are going well. So, I mean, there's a number of you here who've been served on some pretty interesting boards, um, a- a- including major sports boards. Now, the only gift you ever get is the occasional trip to the um, games, and that's about it. A lot of infighting, from what I can gather, from a whole lot of um, NSO boards, uh, not. National sporting um, organisation boards, but you do that because you love the sport and you want to actually give back. But many of the um, pharmacy bodies and things, they pay a fortune. I, I heard one the other day, seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars for the chair for a representative pharmacy. Now that is way over the top. The CPAs, they're all paid well in access. They're paid more than your ASX. 
So, I mean, there's some big industry bodies where they're massively over, overpaid, and yet you've got huge non, non-profits providing major business, major services that aren't paying directors. I think the rule of thumb is if you turn over more than, let's say, a million dollars or $2 million, you've got X staff and you provide um, a profit-making service of some sort, whether it be uh, homeless accommodation or whether it be a hospital or an aged care facility, uh, you are going to have to pay directors because the risk is just way too big Mm. and you're going to lose getting directors. So if you want quality directors, now it may be that somebody from KPMG comes on and goes, look, I can't be paid because I'm a major corporate. But the other thing that you can also say, that they will then give it back. But you can also say, well, why doesn't the corporate put it on its CSR, put it on its CSR policy and basically say, this is our corporate social responsibility. We've measured this. We've given Mary to the board of, I don't know, Guide Dogs Australia for a day a month. And we've put that on as a measurable input that we've contributed to this organisation. So you can actually um, do it that way sometimes too. Mm. No, that, that's really, that's so helpful. Such incredible tips, Claire, really incredible tips. So many people have said they're sorry, they just about have to go. Yep. But um, I've said to everyone that they will get a copy of this video today. Um, but before we sort of wind up our session today have you got any tips yourself um, about any of these sort of things that summarize today's session up because I I personally I just love that slideshow so much and those little tips at the end they were fantastic don't be a zebra hey Um, (laughs) or if you're a zebra make sure you're in a pack yeah make Um, sure there's three of you (laughs) um I think You have to do what you love and you have to do, particularly if you're on a non-profit board, you can't do what you don't love. Um, And I think you have to do what, what, not just what you love, but what really floats your boat and where you want to have impact and where you want to have, um, make a difference. And so I always judge everything by where I want to make a major difference, which is why the affordable housing thing is really my big interest area when it comes to boards. Um, Don't, Just say yes because someone asked you. Never just be flattered enough to say yes. Um, If you are a director on a non-profit and you're tempted to ask someone because they look really terrific, resist the urge and (laughs) go through a process, you you can always get yourself into a whole lot of hot water. Um, So, you know, I think that there are a couple of of, of other things. And, And I think the other thing I think we need to be doing about is Boards are about giving back. Um, Boards about serving. You serve on a board. It is, in fact, about service. And while I think it's important that we start to compensate people for some of this service, that will never happen in its entirety. And so I think cultivating a culture of service within organisations and across the board is something that's a really important value that we can add uh, because without it, you know, many of our communities, particularly of some of our marginal communities, are just not going to function. And, uh, you know, I personally feel that we all have a responsibility um, to, you know, good things have happened to me in my life. I'm really very fortunate. And so I think I, I regard the way that I view boards as, you know, it's kind of my give back as much as anything. But uh, anyway, I hope that helps. And it's been a pleasure to join this group. <laughs> Oh, Claire, I cannot thank you enough. Just testament to what an important subject this is. Over 250 people registered to come and listen to you today. And just just your insights and the perspective that you come from is just invaluable to us all. And I'm really, really grateful. And I personally think that these are incredibly important agendas, Claire. And I think even if we just make sure they happen around our own boardroom table, we are going to be the beginning of the change that's needed. And you're a real leader and a real champion for that. Thank you for your time today. And we are so grateful. Always a pleasure. Thank you. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today.